So we're going to hop right in here. Share. Okay, so this is a picture of part of my uh, patient catchment area. So I live in Yellowknife, which is in Chief Dry Geese Territory, the traditional home of the Yellowknife's Dene, and uh, also the traditional lands of the North Slave Métis. This part of my patient uh, catchment area is further north, so north of the Arctic Circle. Um, it's at the intersection of uh, New Gallowit Territory, Gwich'in Territory, and uh, Dene Territory. And this is the Mackenzie River. So when we talk about environmental racism, um, you know, this uh, water supply is one of the reasons I got involved. Because if you look at the oil sands, Tabasco River goes past there, it goes into, ends up in Great Slave Lake, and then Great Slave Lake's uh, outlet is up through um, the Mackenzie River, which is here. And so, unfortunately, we've done almost no studies into the local health impacts of resource extraction in the oil sands region or anywhere up this river system. And that is a pattern that exists almost everywhere in Canada. So whether you're talking about fracking in northern BC or Alberta, um, whether you're talking about a uh, giant mine here in Yellowknife, um, there are, we, we tend to cite resource extraction projects next to the people who have the least power in terms of saying not in my backyard, that's often Indigenous or racialized communities. And then they also have less ability to say, hey, come to a study, like we're not feeling well. Around the local health impact of resource extraction in Canada. And a lot of that has to do with environmental racism. So I'm glad that we sort of started with that uh, in Canada. Um, as part of uh, what you were saying uh, there, Jen. So in any case, um, I was in Inuvik when I first read about climate change. Uh, I was a new doc and I essentially had decided that in order to really be an adult, I needed to do a little bit of outside reading. And I did that reading in Inuvik in December. And so I basically had a book on uh, the oil sands and I was reading it at Inuvik. And I was like, oh my God, like by the time I was done, I was quite upset. And so then I did a lit review on climate change and it was right after the Lancet had put out its uh, report on uh, climate change um, in 2009 and said climate change is the biggest health threat of the 21st century. So I'm in Inuvik by myself in December, having basically an acute grief reaction. And so then I'm asking around, I'm like, guys, like, did you know about this climate change stuff? And they're like, yeah, we're one of the most rapidly warming places in the world. I was like, what? So then I was asking around and this part of the world is already three degrees Celsius warmer than it was when an 80 year old elder was born. And so it's one of the most highly impacted places in the world. You can see how much water there is there uh, that has huge consequences. Uh, three degrees Celsius is a big deal when you're talking about the difference between solid water and liquid water. So that has consequences for the safety of ice-based travel, uh, food supply and mental health. Some of the very first studies that have been done on the mental health impacts of climate change were done in indigenous populations in northeastern Canada in uh, different parts of Labrador. Uh, Lancet uh, Planetary Health Peace, um, Ashley Consulo. And so the, the ecological grief, eco anxiety literature started in these areas where people live very close to the land, so they're very attuned to changes in the land, uh, particularly when they depend upon it for their health and livelihood and cultural sharing practices. So Ashley did some of the very first work uh, in close partnership with uh, uh, Inu Bialowit in um, Rigole in Labrador. And her co-author in a lot of papers has been someone who did a lot of work with farmers in Australia. So you can imagine farmers also totally depend on the land uh, for their livelihood, on, on its rhythms, they're paying really close attention. And so those are two of the areas where, you know, this was sort of first described. So after that, I actually came straight from there down to the Family Medicine Forum that year in Calgary, had a fit and got recruited to Cape. So the um, next really moment I had, um, and at that point, I hadn't met anybody who'd had that kind of a reaction. I thought it was odd that I was that upset. And then I was a um, new mom. Uh, my daughter was eight months old when I read this article by Bill McKibben. And I finished it curled up in the fetal position around her. And I spent the next multiple months 
uh, waking up in the morning and my mom had had really bad cancer when I was in my 20s. And after she got her diagnosis, my first thought upon waking every morning was my mom has cancer. And for about three months after I read this article, my first thought upon awakening was essentially my daughter has climate change. And, you know, I think this was exacerbated by the fact that I knew we we're already in one of the most rapidly warming places in the earth in the world. And so this was actually the start of my involvement in medical politics. I became a delegate to the CMA General Council immediately after this. And about a month after, because you Courtney, I wonder if you just stop your video, uh, like your slides are great and coming through, but you're occasionally cutting with your sound. So I wonder okay. if we'll just get better um, sure. transmission without the video. Okay, let's get that Sorry. a shot. <laughs> Sorry no, about that. Right. Um, yeah, so anyway, I ended up having my first, uh, presenting my first motions of the CMA General Council, which was in, in Yellowknife, around um, asking for uh, the CMA to support increased peer review studies into the local impacts of the oil sands. So my first um, sort of thing I'd like to say is that in all of this work, um, as we start to talk about this and as climate impacts start to impact more communities, wherever you are, however you're speaking about this, um, recognize that everybody's going to be in a different spot in their process around having the actual diagnosis of climate change land with them and working from there into uh, a different understanding about what they're gonna do. And so what I find this really demands of us is a lot of uh, compassion and patience. And I would just, um, I find it helpful to understand the mental health impacts because I, I don't get angry the way I used to anymore. So why are we worried? We'll just quickly put this in here. So we're worried because right now, so this is from Canada's Changing Climate uh, Report. So if we continue along the high emissions pathway that we're on now, a child born about two years ago uh, will only be 63 when we're 6.3 degrees warmer here in Canada. And we don't know what that looks like in terms of its impact on health or health systems. But as Nick Watts said uh, when interviewed um, during the last Lancet Countdown launch, so he's sort of the world's top doctor in climate change and health, he said it will be catastrophic. So, you know, this is, this is the world looking a little bit more like it feels like right now, except more on a chronic basis. So, you know, disruption in supply chains, uh, civil unrest, uh, you know, difficulty providing services. Uh, we don't want to go there. So if we don't want to go there, what that means is that we need to urgently uh, both mitigate emissions and adapt because this blue line here is kind of where we're heading no matter what we do now. Um, so regardless of what we do now, we're gonna see an increase in two degrees Celsius here in Canada because we're warming at double the global rate uh, compared to a baseline that was set in the uh, 1986 to 2005 period. So we know we're gonna see two degrees Celsius more warming by the mid century, so we need to prepare for that. And then we need to emergently decrease greenhouse gas emissions so that we don't end up on that red line, we stay on the blue line and plateau mid to late century. So. This is a uh, map of some of the mental health and uh, physical health impacts of uh, climate change on health and health systems here in Canada. It's from the 2019 Lancet Countdown Policy Brief that we put together, and so you can take a look at that. So this is just a picture of the farmers who've been impacted. A lot of the studies on uh, climate and eco-grief have shown that the people who work with the information a lot are really impacted. So climate scientists, people who study coral reefs, certainly a lot of people in the uh, climate change and health community are some of the uh, populations that have been, uh, you know, that are, are impacted by this on, on quite a day-to-day -day basis. And I think as we see climate impacts really increasing um, in other places, this is impacting more people in our population. So we did a study on wildfires here in uh, Yellowknife, which is actually the first study I worked on with uh, Ashley Consulo. And we found that in the interviews that we did with people after a severe wildfire season, a lot of people who had lived in smoke for off and on for two and a half months really felt worried all of a sudden. This was a sentinel event for them that changed their understanding of what climate change was going to bring to them and their families. And so they used terms like saying, you know, is this the new normal or I'm really worried for my, my grandkids. And so we're, we're understanding that now as a, an expression of ecological grief or eco-anxiety. 
And so this is the definition that uh, Ashley Consolo and her co-author had in their paper in Nature Climate Change in 2018, which is an amazing paper. So if you'd like to read one, one paper on this, uh, that would really be the one I would choose. Okay, and now I'm going to hand over to Kim. And then I'll start again at the end. Hi. Um, Jen, can you bring up the slides? Perfect. Great. So I am not as seasoned as Dr. Howard. Um, and in fact, my first encounter with Dr. Howard was at a CMA general council meeting um, when I was an involved resident. She came and found me um, in her lovely, lovely way of advocating um, in regards to fossil fuels and, and divestment of that um, as a way um, of CMA funds um, and found me um, and said, I need a young person. And I mean, I'm not as young as many of my colleagues like Claudel, who I've worked with um, to, to speak for this. Um, and then she found someone near the end of their career and said, if, if we can get the younger group and the older group to say, this is important, I think people will listen and, and it worked. Um, so Courtney is very seasoned in her advocacy um, and understanding of this topic. Um, I think my interest comes from the fact that I am one like Courtney, a mom, um, and so have felt some of that anxiety myself, and two, I'm a psychiatrist um, who comes from a global health background where we really know that people who live with a mental illness are already underserved globally, um, and my worry is that climate change will just exacerbate those inequities, as we're seeing in things like a, a pandemic right now. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about some of the emerging um, things. You can, next slide, thanks. So I'm gonna go over some background stuff that a lot of you already know, but I think it's important to hit home. Um, can you hit one more time for me, Jen? So mental illness, I think it's important to define the difference between mental health and mental illness. We talk about them in the media um, like they're the same thing and they're not. Um, and the big important thing to remember is when someone has a mental illness, it has an impairment in their function. So the Health Canada definition is a group of conditions that impact thinking, mood, and behavior, which cause associated distress and impairment in function. What we know is that with stress changes um, in our day-to-day -day lives that our mental health fluctuates, which means we'll have times that are more stressful, we're more sad, times that we feel more joy. Um, but it's when those emotions um, lead to an impairment in our function that they need treatment. And so I think that's where both of those things in a, with as climate change occurs, as we see more extreme weather events, we will have people who have a fluctuation in their mental health. And sometimes that will be protective. We'll talk a little bit about that because it will lead to action, um, but it will also exacerbate pre-existing mental illness. Um, and it will also um, cause those who don't yet live with a mental illness to live with a mental illness um, and in a way that it's impairing their function in their life. Next slide. Um, when we look historically in global health, a lot of time, money, energy, policy, funds went into diseases that killed people. So in things that cause mortality, it went into diarrheal diseases in kids under five, maternal mortality. Um, and the belief when I studied global health in the early 2000s um, was that, I mean, if you look at things like the Sphere Project that talk about how to set up um, an internally displacement camp or a refugee camp. It, it didn't at that time talk about mental health because the belief was that it wasn't important and it was somewhat, there was still a notion that it was a bit of a westernized um, issue and a westernized concept in how we live. I think what we've learned since that time and that the WHO really has championed is, is that global mental health is a concern for everyone especially in low and middle income countries. As we know, it often hits younger people and they have a larger population pyramid. But where that changed was with the initiation of disability adjusted life years um, and starting to look at not just a change in mortality, but a change in morbidity, which is what we really see um, with mental illness is people live a part of their life um, with disability as opposed to them necessarily dying at an earlier age. And it was really this marker that changed how global health was done in regards to global mental health as it became now a disease that was on the radar and important. Next slide. Um, what it did is it started to quantify that these years of life lost as a result of disability occurring were important, important policy actions needed to be done. 
Um, the disability adjusted life years, I mean, they had an expert panel that decided what suffering meant. And so if you lost sight, you had a higher ratio of suffering than if you lost your hearing. And there's, I mean, some personal value set in that expert panel. So it's not a perfect indicator. It also showed that your most valuable at age 25. So you're born and we don't give a lot to society. And as we age into age 25, we're giving more back to our community and are worth more. I mean, that's a, again, a subjective number. In some communities, a 25 year old is, you know, a father of many providing a lot for their community or a mother providing a lot for her community or just a person in their community providing for their parents, caring for them. I mean, I would say at 25, when I was a med student, I was pretty useless for society. Um, so again, I think that, that there is some subjectivity in this marker that I always like to talk about, but, it, but it's a good indicator when it comes to global mental health. Next slide. Um, again, really what happened, the big thing on this slide is that in 1990, what we saw for the first time is that tuberculosis, mental disorders, and road traffic accidents were the leading cause of disability adjusted life years. And this really started to change um, global priorities around global mental health that really were being underserved and weren't on the radar. Next slide. Um, I like this graph. There is um, an issue with the boxes. If you look at cardiovascular disease, it says 2%. It's obviously much higher than that. If you know any epidemiologists, pie graphs are not well liked. But I like this one because visually what you see is that neuropsychiatric disorders account for 28% of disability adjusted life years in 2005. Um, and things that we think of a lot as causing burden, like cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, diabetes, things like that actually are less of a burden than neuropsychiatric disorders. And so we know that at baseline, they're causing a large impact on society, but they're not the things that often get targeted funds. They get a small, small percentage. They get about 1% to 3% of uh, healthcare budget but they're causing 28% of the burden. Globally, often the term mental health or mental illnesses are looked at more encompassing than we do here in Canada, where we think more of schizophrenia, depression, anxiety. Globally, it's more viewed as including things like epilepsy and some neurological disorders like um, traumatic brain injuries and things like that. So it's got a, a bit of a broader scope to it. Um, next slide. Um, so what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is we know prior to the impact of climate change that's happening much more drastically, that we're, there is those who live with mental illness are underserved. So 75% of people with serious anxiety, mood, impulse control, or substance use disorders in low and middle income countries have no care at all. In Sub-Sahara and Africa, over 90% of those with schizophrenia and other forms of psychosis are untreated. Um, and the gap even exists within countries. So there was a study that came out of Germany that shows that those of lower social economic status have less access to things like psychotherapy and first line treatments. So the gap is occurring throughout the world, but also, also within countries themselves. So we're at a situation where I can say, um, as working as a frontline psychiatrist, um, I mean, we're already under-resourced in our ability to treat people appropriately. And my concern is that this is going to continue to exacerbate. Um, next slide. So when we start to look at that interplay between mental illness and climate change, I mean, Courtney's already hit on some of this. What's interesting in the literature, and there's been some great people like Ashley who have done some work already and some studies done in Northern Canada with farmers in Australia, where we're, we're starting to collect some data is there is less data around what's actually happening with mental illness and climate change. There's often kind of emerging phenomenon, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, and I think, I mean, we can make some links with the data that already exists. And I think despite the fact we don't have great data, it doesn't mean that it's not important. We do suspect that climate change may impact mental health directly through acute climate related changes such as extreme weather events. We know when the temperature rises, people are more likely to complete suicide they're more likely to show up at the emergency room with psychosis. We know when there are, are changes in temperature, such as a heat wave, um, that people have changes in their metabolism, um, which changes their ability to, um, to, to utilize their psychotropic medications. For example, lithium, when you're dehydrated, you're more likely to become toxic. We also know that climate change may impact mental health indirectly by threatening population health through causing adverse 
changes in food, food security, displacement, air pollution, and spread of disease vectors, which Courtney showed us already. So we know those that as climate change occurs and causes these types of events, those with pre-existing mental illness will be more at risk um, as they have psychosocial risk factors, including reduced personal autonomy, negative self-perception, insecurity, social isolation, and high levels of stress, making them more at risk um, for worsening of their mental illness. We know too epidemiologically that if if you have um, mental illness, you also have an exacerbation of your physical illness. And this link is not always clear. For example, if someone has a cardiac event and are depressed, they're more likely to die, even when you do um, re logistic regression and model out other risk factors. So we know there's some kind of interaction there as well. Social strain and resource loss will play an indirect effect on mental health, um, as these are often protective factors. I work in a biopsychosocial model, so when I treat a patient, I not only look at the impact of their biology, so which medications, changes in sleep habits, or food will help them to be better. Psychologically, you know, does things like cognitive behavioral therapy and understanding of their experiences going to help them to be better, but what social factors include housing, access to water, access to medications, even here in Calgary, um, and funding for those, um, but also having people in their life or a sense of purpose or a social network that can support them are really important to keeping those that live with a mental illness well. We know that climate change, oh, sorry, will you go back one, um, to mental illness, as I was saying before, this attribution is challenging around what's an association, what's causal, but um, we do suspect that this will get worse, given what we know happens with acute um, weather changes already. Okay, next one, thanks. Um, and then, I mean, some of these, the references are, are from more news articles, but I still think they're important. So there's growing evidence that even the threat of climate change, which is what Courtney was talking about her own experiences that she's had, um, and I would say I've had similar, can cause emotional distress or anxiety. So there was a survey that showed that 45% of Americans are very worried about climate change. And I thought this one was interesting. 30% of Americans are at least somewhat agreed that couples should consider climate change impacts when deciding on whether to have a child. So we know these fears around the future and not just the experiences of what we're, ha what we're seeing today are impacting behavior. So I'm gonna talk really quickly about emerging phenomenon. So eco-anxiety, um, anxiety in general um, is a common human experience. It's something that we all experience and, and at times can be adaptive or protective. For example, I always think of, um, you know, when I'm anxious the night before a test, I stay up later, I study, there's more, I'm more hypervigilant and focused and getting ready for the following day. I don't watch Netflix or read a book versus when anxiety becomes maladaptive, which is that chronic state of worry that we often see with someone who has something like a generalized anxiety disorder, where that worry overtakes their function um, and isn't protective. Um, when it comes to anxiety related to climate change, what is emerging um, is that vague sense of apprehension that's defined in, in anxiety in general in the psychiatric liter literature becomes a response to things like media attention around the projected impacts. So all of the things we're exposed to every day through media um, or our own experiences, our direct own impact um, experiences with climate change. And these responses, it looks like, can be expected reaction to abnormal events so that we're upset, or perhaps it motivates us to start advocating, getting involved in our community, to the development of mental disorders such as generalized anxiety. Phenomenologically, if you look in the literature, there's a whole bunch of um, different terms for eco-anxiety that's emerging. So things like climate change anxiety, environmental stress, climate-related psychological distress, um, these are all terms that are emerging with slightly different definitions, but there definitely is an understanding that there is some form of anxiety emerging related to anxiety. From a kind of more clinical perspective, what that means, I think, is something that we're still learning um, over time as we're seeing it emerge. Next slide. Ecological grief is another kind of emerging phenomenon. Grief related to death, in particular to the loss of a loved one, is something in psychiatric literature we understand really well. Um, it's been written about in sociology, um, in psychology, and they've all kind of come together to give us a fairly robust understanding. I mean, when I trained in child and adolescent psych 
psychiatry rotations, we were taught how at different stages of child development to help a child through grief. Um, but what's interesting about this emergence of grief related to climate change um, is that it's felt to be disenfranchised. And so what that means is it's not as publicly or openly acknowledged. So I mean, if you're in a circle like CAPE, we're acknowledging this grief and we're, and we're talking about it. Um, but it's not to the same extent where if you know, if you lose a partner or a parent or a child, everyone in your community, regardless of your culture, understands that, understands how to help you grieve through that process and comes together. And there is somewhat of an isolating factor uh, around ecological grief um, that we wonder, I mean, I wonder as a psychiatrist, does that mean that that normal grieving process is more difficult to go through uh, and therefore to treat? Um, there's also some discussion about anticipatory grief. So that's the grief around what's going to happen in the future. So feeling sad about a loss that we haven't yet experienced. Um, and then um, we wonder too the fact that um, when you acutely lose someone, you, you go through, you walk through the different stages of grief, um, you acknowledge it, you kind of move forward. But if we're going to see this slow, gradual, ongoing change or loss of ecological knowledge, how is that? then um, going to change our ability to, to treat ecological grief. Um, there's some, some different literature from Australian farming groups um, having lost confidence in the seasonal rhythms of the weather, including kind of that grief and anxiety and feeling that they're less connected um, to their culture. Next slide. Um, emerging outcomes, um, can you click the next slide? So this is a picture, oh, go back, sorry. There was, it was gonna come up. Um, this is a picture of my two-year-old who, like the picture Courtney showed before, was born in 2018. So if we continue on these trends, when she is 63, the world will maybe be a dystopia, um, potentially, but hopefully better than that. I think um, what I have to believe um, because of her is that I have to have hope that through, a critical mass of people understanding the impact um, of these things as even the emergence of anxiety at times which can cause action um, that we will see changes um, over our lifetime that are needed and a critical mass of people will come together for that um, and she's a reminder that um, maybe the generation below us which we've seen um, in protests and around the world um, are more active about their future and, and taking hold of that in a really effective way next slide um, this is my second last slide. So I was uh, lucky enough to be invited onto a paper with Courtney um, and Ashley and a bunch of experts more than me in this area. Um, I think a bit because of my psychiatric background. Um, but when we looked at how to look at a resilient spin around eco-anxiety um, and ecological grief and how to think of how do we create more mental health resilience, these were some of the things that we came up with. So the first one is scaling up training for health professionals. And so this this is things that we already do. I mean, they do it in low and middle income countries around um, giving out antiretroviral therapies where they have a volunteer who goes and rides on his bike and hands them out, where they do task shifting, shifting or they do train the trainer to have everybody have a sense of, of mental health first aid. And so definitely, I think a way to build more resilience is to look at, at, look at scaling up some of the resources um, and techniques that already exist. The second one is enhancing clinical assessments and support. Um, and so definitely for this one, a big thing that we were talking about um, is making sure that clinical support, if required, and particularly if there's safety concerns or change in function, that that screening is being done so people can be sent to the appropriate resources. This really means as we start to collect data on climate change and change policy that we need to include both mental health indicators, um, but also look at building into um, as we create um, systems around if you have an acute disaster that you're making sure you're building in that screening and support also for mental health. It also means we felt in this that if people are functioning well but feeling anxious, anxiety or grief um, around changes in the natural world, that this could be a constructive unpleasant emotion um, which may assist people in making productive and positive change, including dedication, dedicating energy towards the implementation of climate solutions. So it won't always be bad. Um, harnessing already proven individual group therapy strategies. We know already in psychiatry things like group therapy 
um, have great evidence for things like universalization. So I can't sit with an individual um, and help them in a way that a group of people experiencing similar, similar experiences. And we see this in particular also with a refugee population who have similar cultural backgrounds, um, that there is a lot of therapeutic benefit to that. Um, and so we need to look at what we're already doing well around strategies like group therapy, when people are feeling lonely or isolated, um, and use these types of mechanisms um, to treat climate anxiety or grief. Social prescribing and exerting efforts towards solutions. And so this is where there are some, some literature around social prescribing. So um, this is where supporting and, and enhancing physical mental health environments such as encouraging people to travel into wilderness, um, spending more time in nature, um, those sorts of things can also be really beneficial for people around their, their mental health. Focusing on families, um, we know that the degree of distress on children and youth um, is somewhat, somewhat high and it's important to consider a healthy family-oriented response to a shared external threat. So this includes acknowledging the challenge, encouraging parental insight into their own response, providing time to children for empathetic communication, validation, um, supporting them around their fears um, and disillusionment, um, and helping them to get active in the community to make change as a way of, of being therapeutic. Um, and then taking a health equity approach. Um, so again, what I've kind of tried to hit home in the beginning of this presentation is that those who live with a mental illness are already underserved. Um, as many people are for other reasons. Um, and so it's important that whenever we create programs, we are coming from that lens. For example, right now during the COVID pandemic, a lot of our community resources like our day hospital programs are running virtually, but I have many patients who don't have access to a computer, so then can't participate. So when we come up with solutions, we need to make sure that they're coming from that lens. Uh, last slide. So this is the last sentence from our commentary that's coming out in The Lancet, and I believe it's actually Courtney's um, sentence, but I really like it, so I was going to finish with that. Recognizing the mo that emotions are often what leads people to act, it is possible that feelings of ecological anxiety and grief, though uncomfortable, are in fact the crucible through which humanity must pass in order to harness the energy and conviction needed for life staging change, making tasks now required. I mean, we know with anxiety that at times that can happen and it can be productive. And I, I am hopeful that some of the distress that we're seeing in people isn't always causing dysfunction and instead causes action. Thanks. Thank you. Courtney, yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Kim. That was super useful. I love doing these presentations with people from different backgrounds because I learn something every time. So I just took a bunch of notes. Um, this will go over just a couple of the things Kim just mentioned um, and then move a little bit more into how this impacts our, our work in terms of uh, climate uh, advocacy and change making. So I, I was actually um, taking, making my own presentation at the Family Medicine Forum at the back of an anxiety presentation given by Greg Dubord one day, which is you're not supposed to do. And it occurred to me, I should ask him really how he interpreted this. So Greg Dubord is the uh, psychiatrist who does probably the most teaching in Canada for family docs. And he was the person who, who really told me first that he would consider this a constructive unpleasant emotion. So, you know, you actually want the information involved in peeking your head out of the tent to see the line because that's what's going to help you save your life. And so I thought that was really interesting. And just from a sort of um, systemic perspective, I've been speaking with a high level decision maker in Canada who said that she's been approached by pharmaceutical reps who are extremely interested in this idea of eco-anxiety because they see it as a giant new market. So I think it's actually pretty important that we stress this difference that Kim has just made between mental uh, health challenges and mental illness because we don't want to pathologize this uh, overly and end up with a whole bunch of, of people on you know, different kinds of medications that don't need to be on it. And that's going to be kind of a quick challenge in terms of rapidly upskilling the Canadian medical um, sort of group because we, we saw in a survey both the uh, Canadian Federation of Medical Students curriculum survey and one that was done for the Lancet Planetary Health and one that just came out in JAMA 
that this is still not in most people's curricula to a, an appreciable extent, and it's certainly not in continuing medical education. So we really quickly need to help other docs go from a place of not knowing what they don't know about this to a place of knowing so that we don't end up, so that we end up with the treatments that Kim just uh, put forward, as opposed to a whole generation of people on antidepressants who don't need to be. So this is probably the most tweeted outside I've ever had in my presentation. So I, I think that this connects uh, for people. So action, my, my feeling has been that action alleviates anxiety and it also gets things done. And it turns out that's what the developing literature shows. And so when we apply this to climate work, climate advocacy, what I think is pretty fascinating about this is that two things. We need to be taking this into account in all of our audiences that we're working with. And we also need to be taking this into account in terms of our own community. And because it impacts, when you think about the people who are doing climate work, they're the people who are the most worried about it. And so in fact, we're likely to have a group of people doing the work who are highly impacted by this and we need to take it into account. And something um, that I've always taken from this uh, classic and completely politically incorrect uh, medical classic is, um, which is the house of God, is that at a cardiac arrest, the first procedure is to take your own pulse. And I think that this is, I, I still sometimes actually do this when somebody's having a cardiac arrest in the emergency department. And it's about calming yourself and becoming as centered as you can so that you show up in that space as your strategic self, as opposed to your fight or flight self. And I think that this is really, really true in the way we show up in our, our climate spaces as well. And so this has to do with taking care of yourself first. So doing all of the things that Kim just described as being helpful for patients ourselves, uh, so that when we enter the space, uh, we're acting uh, with generosity towards one another and also uh, with a really strategic lens and what we decide to do. So this includes things like being in nature, uh, making sure you get enough sleep, not drinking too much caffeine and alcohol, all of those things. And so now how do, how do we take this information into account in our change making? So number one, um, we need multidisciplinary teams to do what we need to do. And I love this. The thing about these is that if you take an expert and put them into a room with a bunch of people who know something different than them, they, a lot of people find it pretty, pretty threatening. And so we need ways of working in these spaces that don't exacerbate an underlying things that I like to work with in, in those spaces are really avoiding acronyms really avoiding buzzwords because although they can communicate a lot of information quickly, they also other the people who don't understand them. And we need to be really assuming that people don't know the buzzwords. Like when I say even the words just transition at the Canadian Medical Association board table right now, nobody knows what the heck I'm talking about. I have to say, you know, well-paying jobs um, for people who are displaced um, from, you know, a high carbon industry as we make a low carbon transition. It takes longer, but we need to be really careful that we're not making people feel dumb inadvertently as we're doing this work, because I think that that's going to increase the stress levels. So when I first started doing this, I really thought I was working essentially with an information deficit model of change making. So I really thought that I would show up at the Canadian Medical Association General Council and I would be like, guys, did you know climate change is a thing? And everyone would be like, oh, yeah and change. And they didn't. I was really confused why. I thought that I would tell them facts and then they would act. And I thought this even as I was going through my own eco-anxiety process and, you know, was choreographing a dance piece that we performed here in, in Yellowknife, um, you know, as a way of sort of processing those emotions. And, you know, so I think that one of the reasons it's really important for us to take care of ourselves is that the conversations we have as an inward facing community are probably going to be quite different than the conversations we have as an outward facing community. Um, I do have a degree in the performing arts. And so I think that helps a bit. And so we need to be really, really attentive to our audience. So if we are looking at our audience, whatever we're doing, and they look like this, or they look depressed, or they look angry, we need to be taking that into account and thinking, okay, so maybe the approach I just took wasn't as strategic as it could have been. Um, something that I've realized is that um, the more we talk about solutions, the more people can cope with the information. And so at one point I had a conversation with Nick Watts and it turned out that we had both over the course of hundreds of presentations ended up at a 30% problem, 70% solutions ratio in our climate change and health presentations. And I think that's important because for the most part, people know there's a problem. And, you know, now I just sort of get to the bottom line super fast and spend a bunch of time talking about solutions. 
And so when you're thinking about getting people helping, you know, helping them find the energy to do whatever it is that, you know, we're asking them to do really think about the fact that that is being processed through their emotions and that that is what's going to lead them to act. And I've shown this quite a few times, but I think it's useful. So, you know, what are the emotions that lead for people to act? Um, so we know that uh, according to Marshall Gans and, you know, similar ideas pop up in literature and other places, action inhibitors are things like inertia, apathy, fear, isolation, and self-doubt. And so the emotions we want to be generating are things like a sense of urgency, anger, hope, solidarity, or you can make a difference. And I was speaking with, you know, I've been speaking with people quite a bit recently, and I really think people's buckets at this moment of COVID, of civil unrest, are really, really empty in terms of their energy. And so we want to be working with the action motivating emotions at the bottom. So hope, solidarity, and you can make a difference because I just really don't think people have the energy to cope with uh, you know, urgency or anger right now. So in terms of stories, the type of story we use to motivate people is super important. So I've been involved with the Lancet Countdown uh, on climate change for a few years. And what's really interesting about it is it's a, um, a big data project, but it has both a policy and a communications arm built in. And so what that means is about six months before the launch, uh, communications professionals come in and help to shape the executive summary in a way that will then lead to the overall narrative that gets, uh, you know, sort of pitched to media during the launch. And it's the most well-organized effort I know of its kind anywhere. And so in 2018, the story we used was around heat. So watch out for, you know, the heat illness. It's really impacting elderly populations. And we got 1.3 billion impressions worldwide. And then the next year was essentially the same product and we chose a story around children. So this story of every child born today will be affected by climate change with a pretty much the same product. Product um, We got 5 billion impressions worldwide. So really the big thing that changed there was a story and that just shows you how important that part of things is. We need to be really attentive to our photos that we use because those generate emotions. Um, you know, it wasn't long ago we were using polar bears and that's just not gonna work. Um, so I think it's uh, important people are aware of this evidence-based resource called Climate Visuals. Um, they have seven principles for visual communication of uh, climate change, and you can go and see them. And, you know, those are best practices in terms of communications that generate emotions that will help us be more effective. And I think that it's also, uh, we've had some, uh, you know, with the... Um, objective of increasing urgency. We've been using this house on fire narrative. And I think it's really time to incorporate a more textured approach because it puts us in this either or situation that ignores adaptation and also sets us up for like a lot of depression if we don't hit those targets. So I love adaptation. And now when we're talking about families, we were, I was trying to, because there's almost no actual data on this and it was I was getting a lot of media requests about this uh, last year in terms of um, you know mental health impacts with the kids climate protests etc and I think that a really interesting historical parallel is what happened during the nuclear threats in the Cold War era and at that point there's actually a lot of um, quite a few uh, papers which is, that looked at um, the mental health impacts on kids and essentially the, the take home message was that if parents are presenting a message to their kids that's different from the message the kids are receiving from the outside world in terms of risk, the kids experience a profound loss of trust in the ability of adults to take care of themselves and they get more anxious. And so, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, shouldn't we protect our kids from, you know, knowing about the risk? And, and based on this, I, I think actually, no. Um, I think that we need to be realistic with our kids. I think we need to take our own pulse so that we're not over um, communicating our anxiety about it. Like they are one of our audiences and we need to choose our reaction um, as we uh, interact with them. But I think it's really important. We say, yeah, you know, this is a big problem. And this is what we as a family are doing about it. And as uh, Kim said, um, sort of validate those, those emotions. And I think, you know, 
hope is super important. And I think um, the, the youthful efforts that we have are really important. And this idea of solidarity, how do we purposefully build solidarity to help people both from a sort of group therapy perspective and a let's get things done perspective. These are some of the things I've done as a uh, um, I've gone through that have been really helpful, you know, these, uh, you know, mothers, families, movements, I think that these are super, super healthy. And medical solidarity is being built around things like uh, the Just Transition uh, report and the Healthy Recovery report. And the more that we can, as a global medical community and an international community, emphasize the same messages around healthy recovery and normalize um, this type of work. So the Royal College signed this, the Canadian College of Family Physicians signed this, the CMA, the Canadian Nurses Association. This is important. Um, publicizing wins is super important for mental health. We don't do that enough and we should. Like we should be really proud in Canada of our work on cool phase out and we need to tell the stories of those wins to inspire people. Decision making is really important. We need to celebrate uh, things like what Jane Philpott did with the food guide and we need to take into account the risk of treating our anxiety with action to the point that we burn out. This was a workshop that we put together, uh, Will Gagnon and I put together at COP, we did two and there was such a, you know, we could have done many more. I asked people to put up their hand if they felt burnt out and this is what happened. So really sort of always coming back to that, taking care of the home team, taking care of yourself, taking care of your own pulse so that you can show up in those spaces um, as a centered strategic self because I think that once we start to burn out, it's tough to be that person. And um, that starts to impact our ability to get along in the work that we do. All right, so here's the bucket. Let's fill the bucket up with a sense of pur purpose, with love, with patience, with humor, with practical help. Let's make sure that we're telling ourselves a good story. So we are transitioning to a more sustainable and resilient way of life that will offer tremendous benefits to humanity. And let's be hopeful, Mr. Pipsqueak Nick Watts. I love this quote. Uh, we are too young to know it's impossible, so we do it anyway. And I try to just be that age all the time, and I think we all can and you know, time with these beautiful little humans. So there we go. Thank you so much, Courtney and, and Kim. Um, if you have questions, we've got about five minutes for questions and we can push it a little bit. Um, but um, if you've got questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I think probably without the slides, we could all put our videos back on. Um, so um, just while we wait to see if anyone else has a question, um, do, you have, uh, um, do you have a personal, like one personal, you've talked about it a little bit, but one personal anxiety, ego anxiety management tactic? That's like your I, favorite go-to. I really go back and forth between taking care of myself and acting and taking care of myself and acting. So I do all the things. I sleep enough. I exercise every day. Like that's important for me to show up in a strategic way as opposed to like kind of flailing and you know it's it because it, it can be like a bad code in the hospital it's you know when, when somebody has a cardiac arrest if people show up and they're scared their fight or flight reflex is, is uh sort of triggered there's orders going around nobody knows what their job is the diagnosis and plan aren't clear and i think we can sometimes accidentally do that in the climate community and we need to be really clear about it Oh, were you asking that yeah. to me too? Oh, yeah, both, both, to both of you. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, I mean, I agree with Courtney. I think in general, as a psychiatrist, a lot of my life, I mean, I'm someone who needs exercise to be well. And so making sure that I make that a priority in my life is really important. Um, I think it's easy. Um, anxiety comes from living in the past or the future as opposed mm -hmm. to the present moment. Um, so I think when we move in the future we can sit and think about that nihilistic future but that's not always helpful and so in the present moment i think saying what can i do today what changes do i want to make today i think has always been helpful for me um, and then the thing that i do all the time with patients um, and with myself is what we call box breathing mm. slowing down my breath breathing in for four seconds holding for four seconds out for four seconds hold for four seconds which seems simple um, but in particular, if you're belly breathing, there's amazing evidence that physiologically um, you hit your vagus nerve, you slow down your heart rate, and we can think better and more clearly. And anxiety is the opposite of that. It, it makes our thoughts unclear. It makes us feel nauseous. It, it increases our heart rate. 
um, or we just kind of disassociate. And so I think the box breathing um, and staying present in the moment. Thank you. Um, I see yeah. Ping's uh, question there and, uh, you know, shout out to you, Ping. We've had a lot of conversations lately and he's sort of, you give me hope, you Ping, you young, young, amazing uh, medical students and residents. I think having a dual focus on adaptation and mitigation really helps. So I went into Emerge to save lives, but I can honestly count on one hand the number of lives that I, I would really honestly give myself credit for over the course of my career. You know, I've contributed to a lot, but like if I remove myself from the situation, I'm like, no, that person definitely would have died had I not been there. However, I have helped a lot of people stop puking and that's awesome. You know, like <laughs> if you're puking on a Tuesday and then you go to the Emerge and you are no longer puking, that's fantastic. So thinking about this concept that, that Kim was talking about of the Dali, um, you know, if you could, like, it's all about helping people live a better Tuesday. And so when I think about this, um, the more better Tuesdays we can help people live, whether that's from a symptom relief adaptation standpoint, or a, you know, like, let's change the overall greenhouse gas curve and plateau that curve. I, I think that that dual focus can really help. I think for me, I mean, I worked in population health or public health. Um, and before I went into medicine and I worked under Andre Corvo, who has been very involved up north as a medical officer of health and Dr. Talbot, who was never afraid to say what he thought was right. Um, and I think I remember when I, I told one of them I wanted to go to med school, I because I felt like I would see these numbers on my desk, but not know who those people were. I felt disconnected from that human interaction with individuals and feeling like, I mean, I... I work with these people who are courageous every day and see them make changes in their life and feel like I'm a part of it. But what Dr. Talbot told me is I get to help a whole society of people I never meet live a better life. And so I think that that is where the motivation comes is that I am in a place of privilege and power, which I see very evidently this week in the media and the news. And it feels disingenuous not to use that to my advantage. Um, to help people out that I will never meet and help through my advocacy. Um, and I think that is one of the things that motivates me is that we can make huge changes. And you're, you're right, clinically, I think they told me this before I went to med school and they were right. Um, so those of you um, who are in public health, it's a place I think I'm, I'm getting back to um, and will get back to um, as I move into my clinical career as a part of my career. Because the impact comes from that policy change, it comes from that, that advocacy, because that's where the adaptation and mitigation happens. Um, and when we come from a, a place of privilege, which anyone on this call is, then we, we have the ability to, to make change or to help empower those that don't have that ability to do so. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, I'm not seeing a ton of other questions. Uh, and do you have final thoughts that either that you'd like to share? The, the one thing I just wanted to say is I think it helps to bring children into these spaces. So Kim, I was on the CMA board with her last year, and she would bring her, her little one into board meetings. And I did that with Vivi too. I think Vivi actually won the CMA board vote, um, the divestment vote, because I had this, I was doing the whole thing, this little eight month old. And so as we're thinking about uh, changing emotions and bringing hope, I think that having, you know, an intergenerational um, approach changes in this superhuman way that we can't even articulate. So I, I would just uh, encourage everybody to, you know, spend your time with those people you, you are able to still touch in the midst of, of isolation and, and work them into your lives because then it very much becomes a sort of whole of family, whole of society change making thing that feels really good. And mine, I mean, I, I just, I am, I am not been active in CAPE. I just um, am grateful to the work that you guys do and hope as I um, transition and have more time in my life um, that I am able to get more involved in organizations like this because I'm really grateful for the work that you guys do. And I mean, I'm not an expert um, in this area like Dr. Howard. Um, it's an area I'm learning at coming from a lens that, that I work on a daily basis. So um, I think it's been really nice to see the work that you guys are doing and see it grow over time and see you partnering, partnering with people like IFMSA. And I agree with Courtney. Um, med students always make me feel hopeful when I'm around them. I've missed them in the hospital because um, they, they 
they bring these open eyes um, and this hope um, that gets lost um, in those of us that spend a lot of time here over years. I'm not yet, but at that age yet, but I'm sure I will be soon. Awesome. Thank you both so much. I also really, I learned a lot and really valued the also very practical suggestions um, because it can be really challenging to stay in this work for a long time, particularly when you believe in it. So thank you very much for bringing your wisdom and your care um, to our call today. A brief plug, we're continuing with CAPE webinars um, every, I think in June, it's every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and we've got a, a whole range of topics this week uh, on Thursday, I think is a really natural follow up to this conversation that focuses on social justice and climate change. So uh, please come back and join us. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you. Thanks for organizing all of these, uh, Jen. This is community building. This is mental health, I think, support right now for everyone. Thank you. Totally okay, my thanks pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Take care.